Good morning. It's Friday, July 2nd. <clears throat> Hope everyone's having a good morning. And this is Indiana, glad you're on here. We uh, got a couple, anyway, that's good. Good morning, neighbor. And how are you today? Just stay up all night shooting firecrackers. And hope you're not two fingers shy today. <clears throat> Susan, Joyce, glad you're on here too. So, <clears throat> well, kind of a sad day today. Uh, I saw the young man just west of uh, just west of uh, Fort Morgan yesterday was killed in a car accident early 20s uh, just had gotten married and uh, was soon to be a dad <clears throat> so kind of a sad thing to uh, hear about this morning and uh, does remind us of what what is truly important um, in our lives, or at least what should be uh, important in our lives. So um, I, I don't figure we'll probably have as many on here today. Uh, I, I know that some of the fourth, it's Independence Weekend, and so that's good. Let's enjoy our independence that we have. Let's thank the Lord for our founding fathers who uh, were uh, founding this country on religious liberty. And that religious liberty had the idea that government was not going to intrude into our ability to worship God as we wanted to worship him. That, that is why our country was founded. And it was upon those religious liberties that we have and it had absolutely, positively nothing to do with the idea that religion is to have nothing to do with politics. It's just the opposite. The, the government was to leave the, leave the people alone and allow them to worship God as they saw that they should and not be controlled by the government in any way. And, and that's why our country was founded and we have uh, listened to the liberals uh, reteach history and try to re, uh, rewrite history. And uh, we know that that's not the truth whatsoever. This country was founded upon our, our God-given right to worship him as we see that we should. So, and we ought to be grateful for that. And, and I think we also got to remember that government is important. I mean, it's one of the institutions that God has ordained, uh, family and church being the other two. And uh, uh, so government is important, but the only hope for this country is Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the answer, and we uh, uh, need to get serious about uh, telling people about Christ and that's why it's important that Jesus is in government and that faith is in government. And uh, we, and when we have faithless leaders, we we are not going to have the blessings of God uh, on our on our lives at all. So, in Proverbs two and verse twenty one and twenty two, it says, "For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it." But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Uh, that's a promise that, that God gives us. And so what are we to do? But we are to be the upright, the ones that are right and straight, the, the ones that are walking the narrow way, the ones that are telling people about Jesus and, and uh, informing them of what the Word of God says and how what kind of citizens we ought to be, what kind of believers we ought to be. And, and it's important that we do that. And it's important that we stand against a, the, you know, a wicked culture. And, and it's important that we tell people the truth. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, you know, the, this morning thinking about this young man that was killed in this car accident. And, uh, 
you know, his wife is pregnant um, and just got married in June. And, and uh, so, you know, and life snuffed out quickly. And then I, I heard this morning that uh, Catherine Martinez is in the in ICU right now and not doing well. And um, I know that she's ready to meet her Savior, and and uh, this may be close to the time for her. And you know, we 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 just seem to deal with a lot with death over the last couple of years. And and I don't like to be morbid or anything, but you know, it just keeps coming back to us, doesn't it? And just one hit after another. And and but then I read this in uh, Spurgeon this morning, and I can't but help think when he wrote this, uh, it very possibly, you know, Spurgeon was pastor there in London, and they had the uh, uh, one of the plagues go through there. I, I can't remember uh, wh what which plague it was, what it was, but thousands and thousands of people died, and many there in London, and uh, Spurgeon didn't have good health himself, and they they tried to convince him to 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 go o over to the the ocean and stay by the seaside. And they always thought that that fresh air there would be healthier, and wanted him to go. But he said, "That's not my place. I need to be here." And and so he he uh, helped those that that were dying and families and. And he writes this, and I can't but help think maybe that was when he wrote this or right after that or when, when you deal with a lot of, of grief. And, and uh, he uses Psalm 33, verse 21. He uses the, quote, the, the, ver or the part of the verse, our heart shall rejoice in him. And this is what he says. He said, blessed is the fact that Christians can rejoice even in the deepest distress. Although trouble may surround them, they shall sing. Like many birds, they sing best in their cages. The waves may roll over them, but their souls soon rise to the surface and see the light of God's countenance. They have a buoyancy about them, which keep their heads always above the water and helps them to sing amid the tempest. God is with me still. To whom shall the glory be given? Oh, to Jesus. It is all by Jesus. Trouble does not necessarily bring consolation with it to the believer, but the presence of the Son of God in the fiery furnace with him fills his heart with joy. He is sick and suffering, but Jesus visits him and makes his bed for him. He is dying, and the cold, chilly waters of Jordan are gathering about him up to his neck, but Jesus puts his arms around him and cries, Fear not, beloved, to die is to be blessed. The waters of death have their fountainhead in heaven. They are not bitter, they are sweet as nectar, for they flow from the throne of God. As the departing saint wades through the stream and the billows gather around him and heart and flesh fail him, the same voice sounds in his ears, Fear not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am thy God. As he nears the borders of the infinite unknown and is almost affrighted to enter the realm of shades, Jesus says, Fear not, it is your, good, your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thus strengthened and consoled, the believer is not afraid to die. Nay, he is even willing to depart, for since he has seen Jesus as the morning star, he longs to gaze upon him as a sun in his strength. Truly, the presence of Jesus is all the heaven we desire. He is at once. And, I don't know, just a good reminder, uh, our hearts need to rejoice in him and, and rejoice in the promises that he gives us. And and when we hear of this young man, early 20s, I, I mean, his life is gone uh, here on earth in, in just early 20s. And I can't imagine the grief that the family's going through right now and and the, the struggles that they're having. And But I, I just I just have to be reminded that the most important thing that that we can do is is prepare to die and and we prepare to die by preparing for eternity and and we prayer and we prepare for eternity by understanding our need of a savior and trusting Jesus as our savior i, I mean we need to 
we need to settle that in our hearts, and then we need to be praying and witnessing and being under the preaching of God's word and being under the reading of God's word and praying to God that all of our family trust Christ as their Savior and and make sure of that. I, I, I mean, you, you know, we we will prepare our we'll prepare our families for everything and then seem to forget the most important thing and that's eternity. And what we're not we're not promised that we're going to live a long life here. And, and and what is a long life in comparison to eternity? And we need to we need to to make sure that we are we are certain about eternity and and our eternal home and and uh in 2 Kings chapter 20, I was reading this today, and Hezekiah, good king, a godly king, and, and was uh, 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 used of God greatly and, and was, a, was a good man. And uh, it, it tells us, I want to read these first seven verses, tells us that, that he was informed that, that he was going to die. And... Uh, so this is what it says in verse one. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out in the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs, and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, a couple of things that I want us to think about. What would have happened if Hezekiah never prayed? First of all, he probably would have died, right? And, and um, that would have been the end of it here. But he didn't. He did pray. So I, I think that First of all, let's never give up hope for someone. And uh, even whether it be spiritually or whether it be physically, God can do whatever God wants to do. And he, he's waiting to hear from us. He, he wants to hear from us. He, he wants us to pray to him. And, and so here, God uh, gave Hezekiah another 15 years. And what would have happened if he hadn't prayed? Well, we don't know, but Hezekiah probably would have died. What if Isaiah hadn't told him? What if God had given Isaiah the word and said, hey, this is what you need to go do, but Isaiah chooses not to do that? I don't know. Isaiah may have lost his life. Um, Hezekiah may not have heard the message and would have just died without any preparation at all. I, I, I mean, I, I, so here, how, how do we apply that? Well, I apply that in my own life. I need to be telling people what God says, right? And God doesn't talk to me like he did Isaiah uh, in that voice uh, that, that, he, you know, the, that he heard, but he talks to us today through his word. And so we need to be reading the word for God to talk to us. And so we allow God to talk to us and we listen to what God has to say. And, and, and he lays things on our heart and, and people on our hearts and and he, and he convicts us of things that we haven't been doing or things that we should be doing. And, and so we, we do what it is that he uh, impresses upon us to do. And, and let's make sure that we do it. And let's make sure that, that people hear and, and know. And, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that don't want to hear the truth. And that's all right. We're, 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 uh, we're, we're not going to make them believe something. We're just telling them the truth. Here it is. It's up to you to decide what you're going to do. Well, then I find this sad. Manasseh takes over as king when Hezekiah finally dies. And he was 12 years old when he began to reign. So 
Manasseh was born three years after God had extended the life of Hezekiah. Now, so, sometimes I wonder uh, if, if, if some people, you know, live too long. Uh, I don't know. I mean, here, maybe it would have been better if Hezekiah would have passed away because uh, he wouldn't have had Manasseh. And Manasseh was evil. It says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. I, I, don't, I don't understand why some kids choose to, to do the right thing, some choose not to, uh, even if they're in the same home. You, you see some kids make the good decisions, some don't, and they're in the same home. And, and uh, you know, it's free will, obviously, but uh, here we see that Manasseh chooses not to, to follow God in, in the way that he should. And, and it goes on, and I want to point something out about Manasseh. And this is how God reviews the life of Manasseh later on in 2 Kings 21. In uh, verse 14, he says, And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance. The, and the remnant he's talking about is Judah. And so Judah and Benjamin, the last two tribes that haven't been taken into captivity. And so not talking about the believers, he's just talking about Judah and Benjamin, all right? And there, there is a remnant that he talks about that are the faithful, the, the loyal, and, and he never leaves them and, and he'll never depart from them and so uh, forsake them. But here talking about, he's preparing to let these guys go into captivity, right? And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. I, I mean, Manasseh killed a lot of innocent people. And so now I start asking this because of the, the questions that are going to come uh, from this young man that was uh, killed in the car accident is why does God allow, you know, these bad things to happen? And well, here, uh, God is always God. And God is always true and perfect and holy and righteous and just and and long suffering and and loving and full of grace and full of mercy, all the time. However, uh, God never, God has never since the curse promised that this would be heaven on earth. He never promised that. This world is cursed. We we live in a cursed world. We we are. We're dealing with tragedies every day. We're, we're dealing with burdens that, that are, are tremendous on people's lives. We're, we're dealing with immorality that is rampant. We're, we're dealing with hatred. We're, we're, we're dealing with, with murders and, and desperation. And uh, we're, we're dealing with anxieties and depression and uh, you name it. And none of those are from God. Those are all from a cursed world that we live in and, and we should not, and I don't, I don't want this to sound callous, but we, we should not expect just a utopian world here. It's not going to happen. And, and God allowed Manasseh to shed the blood of many innocent people. God has allowed our country to shed the blood of many innocent people. All these babies, millions and millions and and our, and our country continues to think that we will never uh, give an account for that. And yes, we will. Our country will. And uh, but God, God allowed many of the innocent people to to die. And it's man's. And what does God do? God wants us to prepare for something that's out of this world. And, and that's why we're given this life is to make that choice to trust Christ as our Savior and prepare ourselves for eternity, that place that is much better, that place that you could call a utopia. I, I mean, it is, it will be perfect. It'll be lit up by the glory of God. It, it will be sinless. It, it will be uh, peaceful. It, it will be 
holy in all ways, and, and, but he wants us to prepare ourselves for that. That's your choice. That's the choice of every person in this country and in this world. And we can sit here and want to blame God, but hey, it, it wasn't God's fault. Adam's the one that chose to sin and passed that down through every generation since then. And since then, we've lived in a cursed world. And not only is it a cursed world, but it's a demonic world in that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And so what do we do? We, we need to understand God didn't promise that it'd be heaven on earth. God promises us eternal life when we trust Christ. And so let's trust Christ. And, and let's be prepared for that day when, when our life is done. And we can expect that to happen. If the rapture doesn't take place in our lifetime, then yes, you will die. And so, so prepare for that. And, and don't think that you have time to prepare for that later because you're going to live a long time. Well, I'm certain that that young man yesterday, when he's driving down the road, didn't think that that was his last moment. And we do not know. So be prepared today. Psalm 150, and in all of this, I mean, even in this wicked world and in the war on America that's taken place around us and in all of the, the, the craziness and the sadness and the grief, Psalm 150, David writes, Praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And, and so what we need to, to be joyful, even in the midst of a, of a crazy a testing world that we have our savior and that we are prepared to live for eternity. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Now, it doesn't say that we're going to live forever here. It just says that, that we're safe. And, and how are we safe? When, well, when we've run to the Lord, we are safe and we are preserved. And, and nothing happens to us unless God allows it. And yes, we live in a wicked world. And so bad things are going to happen along the way. Uh, here, but only good things are coming to the believer. This is as bad as it gets for us. And so never forget that. And and just walk in this life with no fear and walk in this life with courage and walk in this life with compassion and, and tell people about Jesus because we don't know that that might be that person's last day here on earth. It might be our last day here on earth. And let, let people remember us by what how we lived, how we loved each other and, and loved these people. And, and the last things that we told them, it, you know, prepare to meet thy God and, and prepare for that. And you prepare for that by trusting Christ as your savior. And then Acts 21, Paul gives us that example. I, I mean, it says that, that uh, Paul came into Jerusalem and the day following Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders were present. And so uh, we, we have uh, James, who was a half-brother of Christ, who was the, the pastor, you could say, of the Jerusalem church. And, and so uh, and it says that he saluted them. He declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And there were still those that had gotten saved, but they were still very much Jews and and zealous about the law, and they, they were still telling Gentiles they needed to, to, to become a Jew uh, as part of salvation, and, and, it, and that wasn't right. And so Paul continued to teach on that, and, and he says, and uh, then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Uh, here he is, he's teaching these guys and showing them what they, uh, you know, to how to, to accept people 
that are different. When, when they trust Christ as their Savior, there's different personalities, there's different nationalities, there's different colors, and there, there's different ideas that have taken place. And you, you learn to accept that and take people where they are and help them to get where they need to be. That's just what Paul was doing. Well, here comes the, the religious zealots who hate anything about a relationship with Jesus because what it does, it intimidates them and robs them of, of their holiness that they practice in, in all their ritualism. And that ritualism does nothing in their walk with God. And we know, and they were ungodly. I mean, they killed people all day long for their faith. And well, and that's what they do. They, they take Paul and they just cause a riot and, and they, they beat him and they're screaming and yelling to where nobody can hear what Paul is trying to say. And it's just an animalistic riot that, and it's just like what we have today. You know, it, I, I find it sad that uh, President Obama, before he was a senator, the only thing he was what was a uh, community organizer is what they called him. You know what a community organizer is? He's the one with the blowhorn that starts all the riots. And, and, and that's all he did. And, and, and he's still doing that. And what they do is he, he radicalizes people like AOC and these, this gal up there in Michigan and Minnesota, and, and they get them all radicalized. And then what do they do? But when you try to tell people the truth, they scream you out and, and they won't let you say anything. And, and that's what happened to Paul. But you know what Paul did? He just kept telling them, even when they're beating him, he kept telling them the truth. And he, he even gets sent all the way to Nero uh, and, and while he's there, it says that much of Nero's family gets saved right under, right under the nose of this wicked, wicked emperor. And, uh, what do we do? Well, we, we prepare ourselves first of all for eternity. And then we help other people prepare for eternity because we don't know how long we have. And I, I just, my heart goes out to that McFarland family and, uh, I pray for them, and and I pray for Catherine, and I pray for uh, uh, Kenny and Terry, Rick, and and those guys as they're watching their mom go through something like this. And but uh, Catherine prepared. I, it was my my privilege to see Catherine trust Christ and followed the Lord in baptism when she was eighty years old. I mean, fantastic, you know, and and uh, identify with Christ and 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 is prepared. So prepare yourself and then help others be prepared. And so that, that is the, the glorious news. And I thank God that I live in a country that I can freely do so. Even though they're trying to rob us of that, 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 that little constitution has been such a thorn in their side. And, and, uh, but I'm just the appreciative of our country that was founded upon the, the religious freedoms and liberty that we have. And let's, let's not squander it. Let's just keep telling people about Jesus. So you guys have a great weekend. Look, we're in church on Sunday, 945, 1045. No place we ought to be other than in the house of God, thanking him for the liberty that we have and the freedom we have to come on that day and, and worship him. And we'll have our little picnic afterwards. And you guys are all invited to come. And uh, it's going to be a great weekend. So guys, have a blessed weekend. Enjoy time with your family. Enjoy your freedom. And uh, we'll see you Sunday. God bless.